Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Seriously though, don't you hate it when videos start like that? Sorry, my ADD is in full blast today. Anyway, in today's episode of RPG Horror Stories with D&D Doge, we have a tale about a group that makes a player's first time playing an absolute nightmare. A story about a player's first time running a one-shot that goes horribly wrong. And more. So, without further ado, let's get into these stories. That time my mom accidentally TBK'd her friends. Submitted to the D&D Doge subreddit by Reddit user MetaGigaZ. Alright, while I might have my own share of horror stories, I'm going to share a story about a disaster of a session that was told to me way back when I started getting curious about D&D in middle school. From the title, you probably already know that it was told by my mom, who was, and still kind of is, a raging nerd. It was college, and she had an ongoing campaign going with a group of equally geeky friends, some of which she's still friends with and I've known all my life, to the point that they're practically family to me. She didn't remember who played what, but she did remember that she played either a paladin or a cleric. She didn't remember which only that she was more inclined to heal and protect. One day, she asked her group if she could do a one-shot session with their usual characters. It wasn't out of the ordinary to ask this, and it can pretty much be described as a sort of side quest in an RPG. Optional, but still part of the main campaign. Since the group wanted a little break from the main story, everyone agreed to let her do the one-shot she had in mind. This would be the greatest mistake they would ever make in D&D, and it would result in them going through all of the stages of grief in a single session. The evening of the session came around, and everything was in place. DM screen was set up, dice ready to be rolled, snacks to be had. Definitely a textbook tabletop RPG utopia. My mom was especially excited because she was going to run the awesome idea that she thought up of. It was going to be so much fun. You know the Water Temple in Zelda Ocarina of Time? Yes, I'm sure most of us have PTSD from that temple. There's a mini-boss that's pretty much a reflection of Link, made from a bunch of mirrors making a creepy illusion. Yes, this was what she had planned. She made the Water Temple mini-boss before the Water Temple was a thing. Well, not to be that guy. But Shadow Link was originally from Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, and I now realize that I'm showing my age with that statement. The party was supposed to help with the resident helper NPC get a magical mirror from an underground chamber. My mom doesn't remember why, but she thinks it was supposed to help with finding something that would give them a cool item. Well, the party reaches the chamber, and the mirror is sitting right in the center on a pedestal. The group rolled perception, but the room had no traps, monsters, or areas where monsters could hide out in whatsoever. Yeah, they knew something was going to happen once they took it and prepared themselves for the walls to cave in, or a malevolent mirror spirit or whatever. Instead, a magic field blocked the exit and my mom asked to see everyone's character sheets, because now they were fighting copies of themselves. The copies looked at the party and told them, the rules of this chamber are to fight against the reflection you bear. Only one can remain in this world. Whoever lives walks free amongst the people. The party had mixed reactions, but they agreed that it would be fun to come out on top one-on-one -on -one against an evil twin. So they went for it. Well, their characters definitely were pretty strong. After all, the group was getting completely demolished, and they were getting more and more freaked out. Even though it was a side quest, it was still linked to the campaign, meaning that their characters could still die. The party tank went down first, then the ranger, then the bard, then the magic user, then the other ranger. As the player characters fell like dominoes, their respective players began to get completely pissed off, some more than others. The encounter was already frustrating to begin with, but it was even more frustrating to know that someone else killed you with your own character. Mom distinctly recalls that the tank was the most pissed and totally raged. 
Eventually, everyone calmed down, but the group were all silently looking at my mom with their own forms of death glares. The campaign, which had been ongoing for over a year, ended with the magical doppelgangers killing them and taking their identities. So, my mom thought fast. So, she says, Everyone wakes up from a nightmare that was shared amongst the five of you. So concludes my mom's story about how she TPK'd her friends with their own characters. Sure, the story ended with a Dallas series finale, but I always thought, as a joke, did they really wake up from a nightmare? Or were they the clones, with my mom's character being none the wiser, due to not having been on the mission to know that they were imposters who murdered and replaced her friends? Well, that certainly sounded like a nightmare, both for the players and OP's mom. And so, OP's mom made it a nightmare in canon. I can only imagine how much that would suck, getting excited about a cool concept to run the other players through, just to sit in abject horror as they fell one by one in the quest that you designed. Was saying that it was all a dream a bit of a cop-out? Sure. But at the same time, it would suck to have to end a campaign that was running for over a year just due to one one-shot. In the end, it sounds like everything worked out, especially seeing how OP said that their mom is still friends with them to this day. Let's move on. Borderline Minmaxer attacks my player character, and it gets really awkward. By Reddit user Artemis242. I'm still fairly new to D&D, but this was my first ever campaign. The cast is as follows. Me, playing a rogue thief, but with really high sleight of hand and stealth, because their entire thing is stealing and sneaking. A wizard that is an order of scribes. They are a scholar, our magic expert. Our Hexblade, a highly charismatic and also really good on the battlefield. Our Armor Artificer, a frontline fighter, the big guy. And a monk of the shadow flavor. We're at level 6 now, and we're playing a quite casual and fun first game with a lot of roleplay. Or at least I thought we were. There had been some instances before this that in hindsight indicated that this would end up happening. But here we are. Recently, we found ourselves wanting a bag of holding. My character already possesses one that they stole some time ago. It was quite risky for them, but they took the risk, got caught, and ran. And now, they use it as part of their thief craft. My character struggles with kleptomania. Not to the point of annoying the other players, of course. It's just a character flaw. And this bag of holding is very important to them. Constantly stealing things and putting them in the bag also comes in handy since there's a high likelihood that I carry something that we need at any given moment. So the party wanted a bag of holding. Hexblade brought up that Artificer could make one. Artificer said that my character already has one. I said that it was mine and that I risked a lot and I paid the cost to get it. Not in terms of money, but in terms of getting caught. Wizard argued that it was a bit of a waste on me, and that I can't just expect to have a bag of holding all for myself. Artificer agreed that it's pretty unfair that he should need to waste an infusion just because I want to have a bag of holding all for myself. I argued that my character had used it multiple times to great effect. Earlier, we had performed an attack against an enemy fortress. My bag of holding allowed me to infiltrate whilst carrying a stupid amount of explosives, and said explosives allowed us to win the assault. And then it allowed me to carry out a bunch of loot that we sold to fund our adventures. A bag of holding in the hands of a thief is very practical, I argued. So I offered to get in contact with the Thieves Guild to locate another bag that we could just steal. This was also risky for my character, since they aren't on the best terms with the Guild. Here is where I think we went out of character. Wizard said to me that doing the entire thief thing might not be optimal, since thieving is a very specialized activity that, if needed, they could just hire an NPC for. I argued that I still bring value because my character is great at stealth and infiltration, though Artificer argued that Monk could do that just fine, while also having all the Monk abilities on top of that. Monk looked uncomfortable, although quietly, I could hear him say, She has a climbing speed though. I don't. 
He was interrupted by a wizard who argued that having someone specialized in stealth wasn't necessary because spells. Hex, using his character voice, argued that he knew a guy who knew a guy who could secure a bag relatively cheap. The DM began narrating how Hex did indeed remember that guy and how he mentioned knowing the bag maker. She's got a perfectly fine bag, Artificer said in what I think is out of character again, though DM just looked at him. It's not about the bag, Wizard continued. We need to talk about something. We feel that you're holding the party back. I started to get upset at this point. Your character is a bit redundant. He continued, and through body language, I saw that Artificer supported him. The DM looked like he wanted to step in, but waited to see how the situation would develop. Your bag is full of utility and useful items that you stole. I got my magical utility, an artificer has non-magical utility, and it would make more sense for her, the artificer, to be the one keeping utility. Hex then piped up. Hey, wizard's real name. Come on, it's not that important. So, wizard continued. As for stealth, Monk does stealth too, and he can even teleport. Monk looked incredibly uncomfortable at this point. And your damage output is probably the worst among us. You have sneak attack, but you never use it. Sometimes, I honestly wonder why you're even playing a rogue. Side note, I don't know how sneak attack works. I'm still fairly new at this point, and I haven't found any consistency in when it applies and when it doesn't. I usually just save myself the embarrassment and ignore it. The player's handbook is very clear, and if those were the rules that were consistently followed, I'd obviously use sneak attack. The problem was that it wasn't, and I could never find a consistency for when it applied. For example, if the opponent wore heavy armor, I needed to find a point of entrance. Sometimes that was just through a dex check, though once I needed to use my intelligence to try and remember facts about armor, but then other times it would work as the book suggested, and the heavy armor wasn't even a factor. Sometimes I needed to position myself behind foes who used large shields, and other times it didn't matter. Once, I just couldn't get sneak attack because apparently I could not focus because the enemy was shooting at us. The DM said that it was for the sake of fun and realism, but I told him that it makes me very confused as to when to use it. He told me to think logically, and if I was in doubt, I could ask him. But asking was really not that easy because it usually wasn't received well. Not by the DM. He was happy to explain. But because of the other players. But I didn't know. I just thought it was normal for DMs to pull this kind of stuff sometimes. Hex glared. Monk looked like he wanted to shadow step in real life. And I was trying to hold the tears back. I have some trauma related to being told that I'm worthless. And it was making itself known. Wizard finally said that what he was trying to get at is that my character is wasting an important spot in the party and that I should consider playing something else. Since we didn't have a healer, I should consider Cleric because as of right now, my behavior really wasn't fair towards the other party members. Here's when I left the table, as I couldn't really contain the tears. I sent a message to my left and went outside and ended up sitting on the porch. Monk ended up joining me. He didn't say anything, but he brought me a can of soda from the fridge. And after that, we haven't spoken since. About the bag of holding, my character was very attached to it, so they weren't super keen on sharing it. They did share it, don't get me wrong, though it was me trying to play out another character flaw, and that is on me. I should have communicated that better to the rest of the party, and if it didn't play out like it did now, I'm sure we would have solved it, either through my character going through growth, or through a heist to secure another bag, or through visiting Hex's friend, or any solution really. I'd honestly preferred my character going through growth and learning to trust people more, and being less protective of their stuff. Holy God, this story sounds like a cluster and a half. First. OP having their characters not wanting to share a bag of holding isn't that big of a deal. Like OP said, she was using it as a way to develop some character flaws for her character. 
Plus, there were other ways laid out where the party could have gotten another one. I think that wizard player just saw this as an opportunity to attack OP and her character build, because he didn't like being told no. And then second, the DM adding all those rules to sneak attack really takes away from one of the rogue's primary combat abilities, and even those rules, which were freaking stupid by the way, weren't applied all the time. So it's no wonder this confused OP and made her afraid to ask, especially considering it's her first time playing. As far as I think, a rogue is a good class for a first time player to play in order to get a grasp on how the game is run, and the DM just made it confusing as hell. My advice to OP would to be get the hell away from that table as soon as she can. At this point, it would only get worse, and possibly turn her away from the game entirely. Though, what would you all suggest? Let's move on. But before we do, it's that time in the video where I show a cat to try to boost likes, comments, and subscriptions. He really likes head scratches. But with that, let's get into today's final story. My Father, the Dictator DM Submitted to the D&D Dose subreddit by Reddit user Skeleton Classic In order to truly understand this story, you need to understand a little of my background. My parents met in an online D&D campaign back when they were anonymous chat rooms and you had to assign yourself a name each time you entered. So, D&D has always been important to them, and when they got married and adopted me and my siblings, it was my father's primary objective to get us into D&D. Well, this and Magic the Gathering, but that we could at least do without him. He had repeatedly started up different family campaigns, and even convinced my friends to play at one point. It always fell apart, though, because my father is a my way or the highway kind of guy. If being a lawful good paladin who followed the absolute letter of the law was a personality trait, that would be him. Except with a god complex the size of Jupiter. All of that would lead to our game's ending. Now, the last game we played was a Star Wars homebrew campaign many years ago. I was probably 21 and am now 29, so I can't remember the specifics. All I can remember is that during the campaign, my brother pulled out his spare rulebook that he had purchased for the occasions when our father would use the rules against us, and he was reading over the rules. That was all. He was just reading, not trying to be snarky or anything. My father then asked him what he was doing, and my brother said, reading the rules. My father grabbed my brother's copy, ripped it out of his hands, and threw it in the trash, saying that he didn't need to because my father already knew the rules. I stopped playing with him immediately after that. I said that I didn't care if he needed to write out my character or whatever, but I was done. Though I have played family campaigns where my brother is the DM, because he is fair and just in the way he dictates and plays. But never again will I be subjected or be witness to the tantrums of my father over a D&D &D campaign. TLDR My father is a giant spoiled dictator child, and if you don't play by his rules, then you don't play at all. Well, this story certainly turns the quote, a family that plays together stays together, on its head. It is a shame to hear that Opie's dad was like that as I think the idea of a family playing D&D together is really cool. It just sounds like OP's father was a bit of a control freak, and him taking OP's brother's rulebook and throwing it into the trash is way out of line. Thankfully, it sounds like they all still play together, but they just need to make sure that their dad is nowhere behind the DM screen. But that is all I have for today. As always, I appreciate all of you, and may your games remain horror story free. Until next time.